book of God to first, um, sorry, Second Kings chapter 5 verses 10 to 14. The passage of scripture we're reading this morning is from Second Kings chapter 5 verses 10 to 14 and we will, will read responsively as we usually do from the English Standard Version. Chapter 5 verse 10 to 14. Let's read responsively. I'll read uh, even number verses first. And Elijah sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan several, seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. But Naaman was angry and went away, saying, Behold, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. The servants came near and said to him, My father, it is a great word the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? Has he actually said to you, Wash and be clean? And together, so he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Amen. God has blessed us with uh, wisdom and knowledge and with logic. So there has been so much advancement in science and technology. And uh, we have this process of problem solving methods or troubleshooting uh, the difficult situations in our lives. For those of us who are in software business, you know, engineers, you know, you write a software and after that you try to find the bug. You find the problem, there's a bug, and you're trying to solve and get rid of, eradicate the bug in the software. I never understood how that process goes. But, you know, problem, there's a problem and it's solved through a method. For those, of, uh, p those people who are in politics, they see the problem of conflict in international affairs, of economic trade, and so they try to find a solution by diplomatic discussions and conversations and come to the table and try to find a, a, a creative idea to, to resolve the conflicts and difficulties. And those of us who are uh, teachers, um, Jisun, you know, <laughs> teachers, uh, they're trying to do their best to communicate, to make it effective, the teaching of uh, the contents to the, to the students so they'll understand that we're actually motivated to learn. And so there's, there's a problem of people not wanting to learn, but the solution is creativity and various teaching methods that the teachers always seek after. We have, in fact, all our lives, through our entire lives, maybe the whole process of our lives is try to seeking out those problems and finding an answer, solution to those problems. And in fact, maybe your workplaces are like that. You know, you are hired to solve a problem and you find an answer for them. Through the advancement of, you know, internet and um, ubiquitous knowledge, it's uh, rather easier today to find the answers, the simple answers to our simple problems. You know, last week uh, somebody gave me their laptop, you know, and it was broken. Said uh, if you could fix it, you could use it. So uh, I was thinking, why not a new laptop? <laughs> anyway, I spent the evening on Sunday watching YouTube and trying to figure out what was wrong and. Uh, you know, I fixed it. So there was no screen, but there's a screen, and I saved this, you know, hundred dollar, several hundred dollar laptop, and I was so proud of myself for fixing it. It felt good to solve a problem, and to be able to donate that to children's ministry. So there is actually a laptop over there in the fellowship hall that I fixed. So it feels good to solve something and to contribute, and uh, that's how our lives advance. But as we advance in our ears and knowledge and we gain wisdom, we find out, we quickly find out that there are problems in our lives that we could never fix. Not that, well, the ultimate you know, problem is death itself and nobody can you know, really fix death. And it's something that we accept. But 
aside from death, even death, there are personal situations, personal problems in, in, in our lives, in our family, and also in, in society that we have to acknowledge that only a higher being, our God, is the only one that has the key, that has the answer to a very difficult problem in our life. And we call, in biblical terms, the solution. We call this salvation. That's what salvation is in biblical terms. Salvation is something that God gives as a solution to our most difficult problems. For maybe young adults who just graduated, they are trying to be saved from the problem of being unemployed. For those who are students in high school, they're trying to solve the problem of getting into that great you know, institution, university that you always dreamed of. For those who are sick with a maybe terminal disease, is seeking the salvation, the salvation from this disease, seeking a cure, seeking healing in their lives. In fact, if we were to slice a, a, a side of our lives, there's always, a, a, in every point of our lives, there is a problem that needs to be solved. A deep-seated problem that we have to acknowledge, only God can solve this. I need this God. No matter how successful a person might seem, how happy a family might seemingly uh, be portrayed, everybody has a deep-seated problem that cannot be solved without the intervention of God. Today, I want to look at the story, the famous story of Naaman, and ask this question, how can we experience salvation each day? Just to um, you know, seek understanding, I'm not talking about salvation, the ultimate salvation of our you know, uh, eternal life with God, but here and now, just like Naaman, he got his problem solved then and there. How can we experience God's salvation, a solution that God provides for you and me each day on this earth? How can God, how can I experience that God's salvation today? As you know, today's uh, passage of scripture is a story. And so every story has a setting, right? We, the character today is Naaman. Naaman. And he was no Israelite. He was actually a war general. He was the commander of the army of the Syrians. Uh, can you show us the map? Where is Syria in the ancient Near East? Well, Syria was a country to the northeast of uh, Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel. And uh, they were a great threat to Israel. They always attacked and they terrorized the border cities of Israel. And uh, they were the enemy of Israel. Israel. Well, our, our text of scripture highlights this man called Naaman. He was the commander of the, this army of the king of Syria, and this was a successful guy. He had won over many campaign, uh, campaigns, military campaigns. He had fought many battles. So if you looked in his car closet on his military you know, uh, uniform, you would see many medals on his chest. He was a, a national you know, a figure of pride. People recognized him. He was almost second in command of the entire company, uh, the country because he was loved and beloved by the king himself of Syria. Maybe like a son. He really um, earned the trust of this king. So this was a successful guy. He had all the wealth, all the fame, and the respect. He earned the respect of his fellow soldiers. But like everybody else, he has this problem. He has this deep-seated weakness. And the Bible tells us that he was a leper. You know, in the Bible times, everything with skin disease is leprosy. Not necessarily leprosy that we know of today. And this skin disease was incurable. They didn't have the means to cure this. So this was considered a curse of God. You know, curse of a God that uh, this person had leprosy. It was a disease of, uh, of the one's skin. It's rotting away, and uh, it hurts so much. It's itching all the time. And it was a disease enough to, to uh, separate you from society. But because of his achievement, his military strategy and his genius, he was still in command. But you can kind of imagine what his life would have been like. You know, on a hot, scorching day, under his armor and under his clothes, he secretly 
you know, um, scratching his skin. And uh, uh, there is, um, you know, things coming off of his skin all the time. And he was ashamed of himself. And from time to time, you can imagine him burning, having to burn his armor and his clothes regularly to, to destroy the, uh, the disease on that, that caught on to the, uh, the clothing. And you can imagine how people, they respected him, but they kept the distance from him not to contract the same disease that this uh, Naaman had. So, in fact, he probably lived a very lonely life. This Naaman had one thing so he desperately wanted, and it was obvious. He wanted to be healed. He, heard, he, he suddenly heard this, he got this glimpse of hope, though, when he heard the servant, the slave girl, to his wife, speak something amazing. She said, Oh, if my master had been in Samaria of the northern kingdom of Israel, there's a prophet who could cure him of his leprosy. And uh, he could have just brushed it off, this you know, female slave, but uh, this was a hope for him. So he goes and asks his master, this name and asks his master, the king, for a vacation. A paid leave of absence, right? And uh, I need to go down to northern kingdom, Israel, and find this prophet to cure me. Like I said, because the king thought very fondly of this man, Naaman, and uh, he didn't even, you know, Naaman didn't even request this, but he wrote a letter, a personal letter to the king of Israel, and uh, he also gave all these clothes to the hands of Naaman to give to the king to seek favor from the king of Israel. It says, 10 talents of silver and 6,000 pieces of gold and 10 brand new suits, uh, clothes for the king. This was a grand gift, you know, worthy of a king, in fact. And so Naaman, you can imagine with his entourage, he's traveling, carrying down to Samaria to meet the king of Israel. And uh, he probably was in his, you know, military best, you know, respecting the king. Although they were enemy nation and there was a lot of animosity and hostility, this was a very friendly, in, in fact, a humanitarian visit for Naaman. So he was in his best military outfit. He was with his most loyal soldiers at his side. And this caravan was carrying all the gifts of the king of Syria to the king of Israel. And he finally arrives there, and uh, he gives, Naaman gives that letter, the handwritten letter of king of Syria to the king of Israel. Up to this point, we, don't, we haven't seen what the letter was about, what the content of the letter is. But the, the verses in 7 to 9 express to us what the king of uh, Israel actually said to, um, to uh, the king of Israel. And uh, this is what uh, he said. Right? It read, uh, When this letter reaches you, know that, uh, um, sorry, uh, that you may cure him of his leprosy. When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent you to Naaman, my servant, that you may cure him of his leprosy. You know, he could have been written more of a detail, right? <laughs> you know, he says, I'm sending you my servant, Naaman, but he could have gotten into detail. I know you have a prophet, a man of God, Somebody, that can, I heard that he can hear. And would you be so nice to be able to accommodate my servant and, uh, you know, cure him and do what you can. And these are the gifts on my hands. And please have, fa have favor on him. Maybe the king of Syria was also a military man. He was very, you know, uh, he was very straightforward. Here's my servant, cure him. And as you might have expected, you know, there was a lot of misunderstanding. So the king of Israel said, thought, he actually, he ripped his clothes. He tore his clothes and says, Am I God who has death and life in his hands? How can I cure this guy? You know what? In fact, the king of Syria is seeking war. He's trying to find a, a political conflict here to a reason for to attack our country. And uh, he was outraged. You know, men can be more careful in what they say in more detail. But that's what happened. And the, the king of Israel was so upset and he was angry. He was enraged. And this news got to, guess who? Elisha, the man of God. Uh, and uh, he sent his messenger to the king and say, says, bring him to me. Let, let this guy know that there is a man of God in Israel. If you were uh, a Naaman, from his, stand, uh, his standpoint, 
you are, you are, you are gradually losing your patience. You know, I, by the way, I am the general, the army general, commander of chief, commander of all the armies of, uh, of Syria. And you're treating me like this. You know, you king, you tore your clothes uh, before me. And now you're sending me off to this, this prophet in the countryside without any explanation. Am I like a dog that you can treat me this way? This is so disrespectful. And Naaman could have thought like that. His actually patience was running low. But the only reason that he was able to, in fact, travel down to this prophet was because of his, this urgency, because of his thirst and desire to be healed of this problem, this unsolvable problem in his life. Would Naaman be successful in curing this disease, to in, in uh, receiving the solution to his ultimate life problem? Well, he arrives at the, around the town of Elisha when he was met by the messenger of Elisha, the servant of this prophet. And this prophet gave Naaman a very specific direct instruction on what to do, how to be healed. And when he was confronted with this situation, Naaman was uncomfortable in every way you can imagine. First of all, he says this, I thought that if I were the prophet, actually out of respect for uh, 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 the neighboring country army general, that you would come out personally. And maybe because you're a prophet, you would do something over my, he the, my wounds and somehow, you know, do some kind of service and God would heal. You just send a servant. I haven't even seen your face. And whatever he said also offended Naaman as well. Because the servant told Naaman that, he should go down to the river of Jordan, which was, by the way, just a stream. Um, you know, during the, the dry seasons, it really dwindles down to like a little stream. And he was offended by that small stream. And said, it was like almost, if you mistake whatever the prophet is saying, he could have thought, you know, you leper, you know, you are unworthy, you're filthy. I just don't want you. Just go wash yourself and just be gone. He could have taken that way. And so Naaman was very upset. He was indignant and he was disgraced. And so he complains about how his rivers are better in over there in, in Damascus, in Syria. And why would I come all the way here to wash myself? I had better, we have better uh, washing pools over there. It seemed like there was no solution to this problem and Naaman was not willing to receive this pre prescription that was given by this messenger of the, of the prophet. But our story does not end there, right? At that moment, the, the servant, the slave of, the personal slave of Naaman makes a suggestion. He says, my father, maybe he really loved this master. My father, if the prophet had asked you to do something bigger, something greater, would you not have done it? It's just one this small thing. Why don't you just give it a try? He says, go into the Jordan River and dip yourself self seven times. Why not do it? And so, because he had come all this way, Naaman dips himself once, twice, three times, six times, seventh time. And when he was coming out of the water, he felt something scrape off from his skin. And the uh, Bible says that his skin was restored like the flesh of a little baby. And it was clean. I don't know, some of you ladies work so hard at night, you know, putting all this cream to get that baby skin, you know, baby face, whatever. You know, just once, you know, this general got this baby, you know, white, pure skin that we adore as well. And he was healed uh, immediately and ultimately from this this situation, this problem, this curse in his life. You're probably thinking, you know this story very well. You've heard it from Sunday school, and maybe even you taught this story. What does it mean for me? How can I experience the salvation that God can bring in my life? Well, for your convenience, I've written two principles on your bulletin that uh, summarizes the, the Word of God this morning. The first is this. We need the humility of abandonment of our agenda. Can we uh, say it together? I'll break it up for us. We need 
the humility of aban abandonment of our agenda. For us to experience this salvation that God can bring, we need to abandon our own thoughts, our agenda that we have preconceived in our hearts, in our heads already. For Naaman to experience the salvation, the uh, cleansing of his skin, there were many obstacles he had to overcome. But it was, not those, it was not a very difficult obstacle where he would have to go all the way to the heavens or into the depths of the sea to find this secret um, you know, uh, ingredient or plant to save him. Like, you know, Jin Shi Huang you know, in China, he searched everywhere all his life for that, you know, the, that plant that gives him everlasting life. It is not something that you have to search everywhere. For Naaman, it was an easy step, easy process. But the real obstacle in achieving that salvation was his own agenda, what he had thought. Again, verse 11 says, I thought that he would do so and so for me. But because he's not doing this, because I'm insulted, I'm just going to leave. I'm just going to ditch God, ditch this prophet. As we age, you know, in life, um, I'm very young still, right? <laughs> but as we get older and more mature and experience becomes our luggage and baggage as well, we have a tendency to rely upon our own agenda or own experiences all the more. That is our, ten our tendency as a sinful person. Instead of trying to learn from others, we, try, we tend to try to teach others what the things are in life. But the wise person, the truly humble person, knows when they need to learn and humbles themselves to learn uh, and, uh, from an authority in, in their lives. Of course, we all have some standard and we have the logical process of solving, problem solving in our lives. But when we confront somebody who has the answer, we truly know that they have the experience, they have the power to solve the problems that I'm going through. The right way is to submit, to be humble and to learn, even abandon our preconceived ideas and experiences to receive the things that that authority has for us. So that's very logical, but the problem is, this is the tricky part. Many times in our lives, we don't realize that that is the hand of God. We don't see the hand of God in the little slave girl of my wife. We don't see the hand of God in the, the voice of the suggestion that my servant is making before I turn away from all that has happened. We are so caught up in, I thought, I would think, this, I would believe if it were this. We are so caught up with our understanding, our own, own, our own agenda and thoughts, that uh, it is so difficult to miss what God is trying to say around us through his people. Although Naaman, his ego was probably destroyed, right? He was devastated and he was disgraced. But to his credit, he had the heart, he had the ear to listen to the slave girl of his wife. He had the humility to hear the servant. He had the humility to hear the messenger of Elisha. When we hear what God is saying in the most humble way, we too can experience the salvation that we need desperately each day. We can see that uh, Naaman is gradually letting down his defenses and receiving what God has said. You know, let me tell you something here in the scripture that is not very apparent, but actually it's true. Is that Naaman sensed God was leading him up to this point into the Jordan River. It seems like he was resisting and he's, he's disappointed, he's angry, he's about to turn away. But we know that he was conscious. He was aware. Maybe this is what God is saying. Maybe this is what God of the creation is saying and, and doing for me in order to heal me. How we, do we know that? Well, we can know by reading what he does right after he's cleansed from his disease, leprosy. In verse 15, which uh, was not on the PowerPoint, but uh, it's uh, in your Bible, the next verse. Let me read it for us. Or actually, do we have it on the screen? 
15? Oh, you do. Thank you. Let's read verse 15 together. Ready? Go. Then he returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and he came and stood before him, and he said, Behold, I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel, so accept now a present from your servant. Right after he was healed, after the seventh dip, he praised whom? He says, Now I know that God is the true God. He is the one who has cured me, and he is the true God that can cure all our problems. How did he know that? He knew because he suspected all this along, all this time along, as he saw his God's servants speaking the words that he needed for salvation. As he was humbling himself and following these uh, uh, words of God, and he, as he experienced the salvation that he needed, he was able to confess with this beautiful confession Behold, I know that there is no God in all heaven but Israel. That God, you are the true God. And God revealed himself to this Naaman. When we let go of our, abandon our agenda, our preconceived ideas and experience, and what does it take to do that? It takes humility. As we humble ourselves, as we are humble, as we uh, lay down our agenda and we ex exercise the humility of abandonment of our agenda, we can experience the salvation of God. I pray, I pray and bless that us, you and I, would have the humility to abandon our agenda whenever God speaks to us. Let's abandon our own small experience. Maybe sometimes, God can speak to you through your employees if you are managing something. Maybe God is speaking to you through your spouses whom you are so comfortable with. You would never think that God would speak to your spouse. But maybe God is speaking through their lips. Maybe God is speaking to somebody, through somebody who is much younger than you in your small group. Maybe your student. And when we feel that God is leading us through his people, we need to have the humility to listen. You know, I've uh, actually shared this, this poem with you, uh, this Korean poem, to some of our Korean congregation, but I translated it into English. Poem never really translates into um, English, but uh, is, can you show it to us, Faisal? Is it on there? Yeah. It's uh, That Flower. That's the name of the poem. And it says, I saw it on my way down, that which I'd failed to see on the way that's it. It's a very short poem, but it, it captures the idea there. When we are full of our ideas, our own agenda in our minds, and we are just rising and climbing up that you know, competitive ladder in society, we don't hear, we fail to hear the word of God, what God is saying in our lives. But in those times when we humble or we're humiliated even, and we are made to humble ourselves, and we come down, then we see that person. We see that wisdom that God has put around us to help us, to save us from our difficult situations. You see, salvation starts from the heart, I believe. All of our any of our problems, the salvation to our problems, it starts in the heart. It starts with our humbling ourselves before the one who has all the answers. You know, I try to go to, you know, different, uh, you know, workplaces where you guys work during the lunchtime and spend some time together and have lunch. And then every time I visit, I share a word of God for that, with that person and pray for it, whatever situation. And uh, I'm so blessed when that person is just so receptive of that word with amen and they're just eagerly praying that God would do whatever on that verse uh, in their lives. Because... In that conference room, in that workplace, it's filled with so many agenda, many uh, you know, um, uh, creative ideas of uh, people and agenda and scheduling and all that. But at that time, they are choosing God. God, let this be true in my life. I choose your wisdom. Let this come be true in my life. They are choosing God's solution in their lives. And it blesses me to see their true wisdom in their lives. Is that me? Am I making that noise? I have no idea. I'm not doing anything here. <laughs> but uh, we pray, I pray that all of us will be able to let go of our agenda when God speaks to us, to us, the people of God.
We need the humility of abandonment of our agenda. And secondly, let's not stop there. We need the humility of obedience to the word of God. We need the humility of, the, of obedience to the word of God. Verses 13 to 14. Uh, Naaman was not able to receive the salvation that he needed just by a humble attitude. He actually had to go down to the Jordan River. He had to go down and dip himself, himself not three times, not six times, but seven times. He had to go through whatever God had said to him. Unless he had the actual humility to obey what God said, he would not have received, experienced this salvation. You might think, why number seven, right? Why did he have to wash himself seven times? Does God, is God impotent? I mean, is he not powerful enough to do it in one, one time? Why seven times? You've got to understand the number seven in the Bible. Number seven is God's signature. It's God's way of saying that this is my work. I did it. It's not by happenstance. It's not by the water that the, uh, whatever chemicals in there happen to be there and not uh, dissolve the disease. It was my hand. I see a lot of, you know, sculpture over there at Stanford, you know, rotting, uh, you know, sculpture. And how do we know these are authentic, genuine? They say it's authentic. Do we just take their word? We know because we look at the bottom and there's a signature of the author. Just like that, God has put the signature to his healing miracle in Jordan. He says, do it seven times, my number, and you will know that I have done it. When we have the humility, it takes humility to obey every word of God. We experience the salvation only that he can bring. In fact, Jesus praises Naaman. Did you know that? Several hundred years later, Jesus himself praises Naaman. I'm not kidding. Luke 4, 27. Let's read it together. Luke chapter 4, verse 27. It's on the screen. Let's read it together. Go. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elijah. And none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. It's very clear. You know, Naaman the Syrian, the general. Remember him? Among all the people of Israel... They were never saved. They were never healed of this leprosy. Only Naaman the Syrian, who had this humility, who had the submission to the Word of God, he was healed. In fact, this teaching of Jesus is expanded. And Jesus himself, he lives out this faith of Naaman. He practices, he shows us what it means to perform humility. To bring salvation, not to himself, but to the entire human race. And we read in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 and 8, these two verses. Uh, actually, these are beautiful verses. Can we read this together in one voice, in honor of God, word of God? Let's read. Ready, go. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. I sometimes imagine, what if Jesus stopped, you know, being persecuted at some point? We know that he was in Pilate's court. He was punished. He took the, you know, 39 lashes. And he also was, wore the thorn of crowns. And he was spat upon and ridiculed and disgraced. What if, as he was being whipped 38 times and suddenly rose up, that's enough. Haven't I proved my love to you enough? Isn't this enough? Haven't I been spat upon you? I've received all the uh, disgrace and, and your uh, abomination on, on myself and, and uh, you've in, in, infamed me. And yes, this is enough. And he brings, he brings all his angels and he suddenly gets up and just stops there. He would never have us re accomplished our salvation. But as this verse says in Philippians chapter 8, 2, 8, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And because he, Jesus, he not only was whipped and suffered and persecuted, but he died on the cross and God the Father raised him on the third day, you and I received the ultimate salvation to our sin problem, our death problem. Like Brother Hijin, 
His Father. Although we are in grief, we know that we can meet Him someday in heaven because there will be a morning of resurrection. Morning of resurrection when we will see Him face to face again. So we are sad, but we are not too sad. Our faith is in the humility of Jesus Christ who humbled Himself and hung on the cross and was raised on the third day. In fact, let me go a little bit further. The cross and the resurrection was God's signature. Saying that this is my act of salvation. This Jesus who hung on the cross 2,000 years ago was not just a Jewish young man who was a teacher and he was a benevolent guy who did all these good. No, he was and he is the Son of God who can raise from the death. He who had no sin was raised from the dead. This is my signature. He is my son. I have accomplished your salvation. The Bible is therefore telling us, let us fix our eyes upon this Jesus, who is the starter, beginner of our faith. And he says, and Paul says, again, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. He was humble, the king of humility, for us to receive daily 